As the world comes to realize the coronavirus may not go away anytime soon, we're turning to science to answer the one question at the top of everyone's mind. Can we find a vaccine? The answer is not as simple as you might think, but giant pharmaceutical companies like Johnson & Johnson are betting billions that their best minds can crack the code. In this episode of Influencers, I speak with Dr. Dan Baroque, professor of medicine and immunology at Harvard Medical School, about his experience with the virus and just how close we are to discovering a vaccine for COVID-19. Welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Dr. Dan Baroque of Harvard University. Doctor, nice to see you. Thank you, Andy. Good to see you, too. So you are at the forefront of fighting COVID-19, and gee, big question, but tell us about what you're doing right now. Let's just start with that. Well, um, so many things in each day, but uh, uh, we published a paper about two weeks ago uh, demonstrating the preclinical immunogenicity and efficacy of the AD26 based COVID 19 vaccine that we have developed together with our industry partner, JJ. &J. And uh, we're in the middle of uh, working with them on phase one and two clinical trials for that vaccine. Yeah, what is your assessment of, of where the current progress stands on all the vaccine, the vaccine endeavor, all the multiple vaccines out there right now for coronavirus? There have been a lot of uh, challenges and issues with COVID-19 that have really not gone very well. Uh, but I would say that vaccine research overall for the field has gone very well so far in terms of the field developing not one, but multiple different vaccine candidates, uh, um, many actually at, at certain levels, and at least about a half dozen vaccine candidates that either are or will soon be in large scale clinical trial testing for efficacy. So I think the vaccine field has advanced uh, very well. And so far, uh, we have not encountered any major scientific hurdles that will make us think that the vaccines will be unsuccessful. Of course, we can't be sure they will be successful until we see the results of the large scale human studies. But there's nothing that we know now that would make us say that for sure they're going to not be successful. I know people always ask you this, or they must ask you this, doctor, but when do you anticipate we will have a vaccine? Well, um, I, I think that it's, it's very difficult to predict the future. We, of course, would hope to have a vaccine as soon as possible, but at least in my opinion, only when it's been proven to be safe and effective. Uh, because I think that's absolutely critically important for any vaccine, even during a pandemic period, is to show that a vaccine truly is safe and effective. And that can only be done uh, by large scale clinical trials. So in terms of the current clinical trials that are underway, the hope is that uh, those might read out by uh, uh, late fall, perhaps by the end of this year. And so it's theoretically possible that there could be one or more vaccines available for emergency use authorization uh, this winter by the end of this year, or perhaps more likely beginning of 2021. Uh, but that doesn't mean that's the calendar date that uh, anyone can go to their local uh, pharmacy or physician to get a vaccine. That will likely take longer. So even the vaccines that are currently at the forefront will likely need uh, uh, a number of months uh, before enough can be manufactured and distributed to allow the general public to be vaccinated. So I would say the most optimistic scenario is that uh, one or more vaccines will be available for emergency use authorization uh, by the end of this calendar year or beginning of 2021. And then the vaccines becoming more available for the general public sort of throughout the 2021 calendar year. But of course, we also know that not everything goes absolutely perfectly first time in science and medicine, uh, in which case then, of course, the timelines will have to be revised. So there's no promises, but I just wanted to share what, what I think is the most optimistic scenario. Very interesting. And so it's probably a case that President Trump is being a little 
shall we say, optimistic, perhaps, uh, when he talks about Election Day? Well, I, I think, I mean, optimism, I think, is good uh, so long as vaccines are shown to be safe and effective. But I would not want to rush vaccines uh, and to move forward with a vaccine for the general public uh, that has not been shown to be safe and effective. I think that would be a mistake. Can you talk to us a little bit, Doctor, about why there are so many different vaccines and what's the difference between the J&J &J vaccine and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and the Moderna vaccine? Why are there so many different ones and how are they different? So first, I'd like to say that I am very much supportive of the idea of developing multiple vaccines in parallel because fundamentally, each of these vaccines is very different from each other. And it's possible that some may work and some may not work or even if they all work, that each vaccine will have pros and cons. So it's very important for the overall success of the vaccine effort to have multiple vaccines under development so that if one or more do not make it for any of a number of reasons, that uh, there are enough other ones that are still in progress. So vaccines do fall into different classes though. For example, uh, an RNA vaccine technology is RNA of the COVID spike protein with a lipid nanoparticle. Those vaccines are being pursued by uh, Moderna as well as Pfizer. Um, the use of a common cold virus as a vector to bring the COVID-19 spike protein DNA into cells, uh, that's a technology we call adenoviral vectors, and that's a technology that is being pursued by AstraZeneca as well as by J&J. &J. And um, another technology is to produce the coronavirus spike protein as a purified protein and deliver it with an immune booster in humans. And that's the technology being pursued by a Novavax, for example. And then there's uh, at least two Chinese companies that are pursuing a tried and true um, uh, method of uh, developing an inactivated virus vaccine involving uh, growing up the virus in the lab and then inactivating it and then using that as a vaccine platform. So there are, there are multiple different vaccine platform technologies and um, a couple different companies pursuing each one of them. So in that sense, I think that uh, the, vac the, the worldwide vaccine effort does span uh, uh, the current cutting edge technologies in multiple arenas. So in that sense, I think that uh, we will see which ones uh, uh, are the safest, are the most effective, are the most durable, and ultimately are the most deployable for this pandemic. So it's possible to have different solutions from different, these different types of platforms, all of them say meeting all those various criteria and, and actually being rolled out. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very possible that there might be uh, multiple vaccines that prove safe and effective. At least that would be my hope. In which case, um, uh, then, then, then the more vaccines that become available, the better. Because each vaccine might have some pros and cons. Some might be uh, more effective. Some might have different side effect profiles. Some might be particularly good in the elderly or the young populations. Uh, some might have different um, uh, costs associated with them. Uh, some might have different adverse event profiles. Some might be produced at different magnitudes. And so I think that uh, we have over 300 million people in this country and over 7 billion people in the world. And no single vaccine uh, developer is going to be, be, able, be able to provide vaccine for the global market. So I actually think that we not only want, but we actually need multiple vaccines to be successful. You hear about 50% efficacy. Is, is that the best we can hope for with these kinds of vaccines? It's certainly not the best we can hope for. I believe that the FDA uh, said that, uh, at least at the present time, they would consider 50% a floor for approval. Uh, but um, a, a, a floor for approval doesn't mean that that's all we can hope for. In fact, I think we would certainly hope for something substantially higher than that. Uh, I can't give you an exact number because we don't have any way to gauge it for humans. Uh, we do know that in non-human primates, vaccines have proven to be uh, very effective. Uh, but for humans, we simply don't know. But whether it will be 99% effective or 80% effective, 
or 51% effective, I think really, really uh, is still to be determined. Are other viral vaccines close to 100% effective? Is there anything in this ballpark that already exists to fight other diseases? Well, there are some vaccines that are very effective, such as the measles vaccine, uh, the, um, uh, the smallpox vaccine, the polio vaccine. Uh, there is history of vaccines being very, very effective. Then again, there's some vaccines that are generally only more modestly effective. The influenza vaccine, for example, often is only about 50% effective, depending on the year, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. Uh, so there is a, there's also a history of using vaccines uh, for public health purposes that are less than 100% effective as, as well. Right. What do you make of Operation Warp Speed, which is essentially the, the role that the US government is playing in funding vaccine candidates? So I think that it is, it is very important that the government is investing in vaccine development. And uh, some parts of it make a lot of sense. For example, um, helping uh, providing resources to multiple different vaccine developers to produce multiple vaccines. And then the willingness to take financial risks, such as the willingness to, or to providing, helping to provide resources to uh, manufacture vaccines at large scale before uh, the demonstration of clinical efficacy. So that if we are fortunate enough to have a safe and effective vaccine, um, uh, that the, the time between that event and having a vaccine available for the public is shortened as much as possible. That's something that can be done by taking a financial risk that poses no additional safety risk to participants. I think that um, some people have, have misinterpreted speed as lack of attention to safety, uh, which, which, which is not actually the case at all. And uh, the studies are being designed large scale uh, specifically to have a large safety database. So I think that uh, it's, it's important that the government has invested in heavily in vaccines. And I think it will result in safe and effective vaccines a lot sooner than would have been done otherwise. Uh, but I do agree that uh, it is incumbent upon um, not just the government, but vaccine developers and scientists and physicians to ensure that these vaccines, although being developed quickly, will have a robust safety database and all indications are that they will. Will or, or should that affect pricing of the vaccines? So, so I, I'm certainly not an expert on, on, on pricing of vaccines. Uh, I do know that J&J uh, 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 &J has committed to providing uh, the COVID-19 vaccines um, on a nonprofit basis. I believe that some companies, not all, but I believe some companies have agreed to that. Um, but also, the vaccines also come with different intrinsic costs. So some vaccines might, might just be uh, more costly to, to produce. And uh, I also am aware that the U.S. government has uh, had purchase contracts with many of the vaccine developers, uh, and the goal is to uh, uh, provide them uh, to the general public um, uh, potentially with no charge or at very modest charges. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to roll out, uh, but uh, the goal is, to, is not to have a cost be a burden to uh, the general public. Let's talk a little bit more, Dr. Baroque, about the J&J &J endeavor that you're spearheading, I guess, or working on from um, the research side. Um, where exactly did things stand? Did you actually have meetings with Alex Gorski, the CEO of J&J, &J, about this? How, talk about the relationship a little bit as well. Uh, sure. So, 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 so our relationship with J&J &J has been a collaborative partnership that started long before the COVID-19 pandemic. We've actually been working together with the J&J &J team in the development of vaccines for other viral diseases. We've been working with them uh, on HIV for the last 15 years. HIV, of course, uh, 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 has uh, some unique challenges uh, that, uh, that, that, that are not, not part of the COVID-19 effort. Um, but we've been working with them for many years in the development of HIV vaccine candidates. And in 2016, we worked with them in the development of a Zika vaccine candidate, also based on the same AD26 uh, vector platform. And so in January of this year, 
then it was natural to uh, partner with them again in the use of this same vaccine platform for COVID-19 because it has been used in over 80,000 individuals worldwide, the I-26 vector platform. Uh, J&J has approval for their Ebola virus vaccine. So it's no longer an experimental platform. It has at least one regulatory approval. Um, and also um, uh, at J&J, they've been able to industrially develop that platform so, so vaccines could be mass produced. So we started the collaboration on the COVID-19 vaccine with J&J in January of this year, uh, but that, that's really building on uh, uh, a collaboration that has, uh, uh, that, that we have partnered with them for other viral pathogens before this. So do you have you met Alex Gorski? Do you actually talk to him about this? I have, yes. And um, uh, Alex, as well as uh, Paul Stoffels and uh, the entire leadership team, as well as the entire scientific teams at J&J &J are incredibly um, enthusiastic and, uh, uh, and, and very, very supportive of this program. Right. And, and so you had the study last month that showed promising results. And where do things stand right now? Well, right now, the phase one and phase two trials are underway with this vaccine. They started last month. And uh, we don't have any information to share yet from those studies because they're still ongoing. Uh, but uh, what I can share is that uh, if the early data looks good, if the trial is successful, if the early data looks good, then we're hoping to start a phase three trial um, in 30,000 individuals uh, next month in September. And of course, um, uh, that trial will be led by J&J &J together with the NIH-supported uh, CoVPN. So what is a, a day like for you? I mean, I almost feel badly taking some time to ask you these questions. I mean, your work is so important. How do you, do you ever take a break? Do you work 23 hours a day? What's it like? Uh, 24 when I can. <laughs> um, but it, it, since, since, uh, since January of this year then, uh, it's, it's been uh, incredibly um, uh, demanding and incredibly intense work. Uh, we have wonderful partners at J&J. &J. Our academic collaborators are wonderful. Our clinical trial partners are wonderful. So incredible hard work, uh, but also incredibly rewarding. And um, uh, we just want to do everything we can to help solve this global pandemic, or at least uh, uh, contribute to the solution uh, if we are able to. How much do you talk to scientists and doctors who are working on the other vaccines? Is that something you do or not? All the time. Mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there, is, there, are, there are many different forums for uh, uh, people engaged in the different programs to communicate with each other. And whether it's locally in the academic space or in conferences or in um, uh, government-sponsored uh, groups, uh, then, then there's a lot of interactions among the different uh, vaccine, uh, vaccine research groups. Um, Bill Gates and others have said that the vaccine may require multiple doses. What is your take on the likelihood of that? I think that most vaccine programs are envisioning a two-shot regimen. Um, uh, the J&J &J program uh, in phase one and two trials, we're testing both a single shot and a two shot version of the vaccine. Um, and then the question is, will any or all of these require booster shots, say annually or at some, some prescribed interval? And that really comes down to the question of the durability of the vaccine. Um, and uh, the durability of a vaccine, how long immune responses last is really an unknown question. It's really a question that is yet to be, yet to be resolved for any of these vaccines. So I think the, the short answer to your question is we don't know yet, uh, but, but uh, the, that will become clear as time goes on based on uh, how long lasting the vaccine induced uh, antibodies uh, last. I'm cognizant of our time here, doctor. So just a few more questions, but I know you've got to hop in a minute or a few minutes here. Um, what about um, distribution of vaccines and favoring at-risk groups? Is that something we should be doing? So 
there will be um, uh, panels of experts that uh, give recommendations on how vaccines should be distributed. I believe it's not going to be uh, up to the companies. It's going to be up to um, uh, panels of experts on how the government decides to prioritize different groups. Um, but it, it's clear that the day that the vaccine is approved, there's not going to be enough vials available in every corner store for every single person to get vaccinated the same day. That's for sure. So there will be there will have to be some sort of staging. But the hope is that uh, the manufacturers of vaccines will be able to upscale their manufacturing in a way that will shorten that time interval, that will allow uh, everybody who wants to get vaccinated to get vaccinated. How do you assess where we stand right now with the coronavirus just in the United States, handling it, um, the, the cases, the, the rate, where do things stand in your mind right now? Well, we of course would, 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 would prefer if the virus had uh, dissipated on its own. And, it, and we would of course prefer if vaccines weren't, weren't needed because the epidemic uh, uh, had gone away. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, the epidemic is still with us. And it looks like um, the virus has penetrated the human population to an extent that a vaccine or vaccines will likely be needed as part of a solution to end the pandemic. So, so, so I actually um, I think that uh, both public health measures as well as eventually a vaccine are going to be needed uh, for, for an ultimate solution to the pandemic. What about the people who say, hey, listen, we're just gonna get herd immunity anyway, so like, just let it be. So uh, there's two ways to generate herd immunity. Either the majority of people get infected or the majority of people get vaccinated. Uh, and um, if herd immunity is going to be required to end the pandemic, then uh, the number of lives lost uh, uh, by having the majority of people infected will be much, much higher. Right, and, and, and finally, doctor, what is it that we don't understand about COVID-19? Are there misconceptions out there um, that myths people are propagating? What do you think? Well, there's there's uh, there's always uh, uh, areas uh, that uh, we need more education on, uh, but I would say there's also a many areas that uh, uh, that we fundamentally don't understand from a scientific level, uh, such as um, uh, such as as I mentioned before, the durability of a vaccine is not known yet, and that is, that is information that will be known soon, but we just don't know that yet. Uh, also, why some people have very severe disease courses and other people don't. I think that's a fundamental question that we don't know, we don't definitively know the answer yet. Why most people have a relatively mild form of an illness, but some people have incredibly severe illnesses. We don't know the answer uh, why some, um, some host pathogen uh, mixtures result in a very severe illness and others don't. So there's many aspects of basic viral biology that we don't understand. But also I think there's a lot of uh, education that we need to um, uh, provide to, to the general public as well. Dr. Dan Baruch of Harvard University, we really wish you the best of luck on your work and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.